And I'll move to our next speaker, um, Joost de Koning. I saw him online, so if he can start his video, we can see his... Uh, in, yeah, in, I'm, his I'm there. Ah, there he is. <laughs> Joost is uh, an associate professor with us here in Amsterdam um, at the faculty of uh, used to call human movement sciences now as behavioral and movement sciences. Um, he's also an adjunct professor at the Department of Exercise and Sports Science at the University of Wisconsin in the US. And his interest um, in research ranges from biomechanical modeling to high performance exercise physiology and anything in between. And he's recognized for multiple areas there. But for today, um, he's going to focus, I believe, on the biomechanics and physiology of uh, speed skating and shows a few tips and tricks uh, what to watch for when. Uh, when our boys and girls get on the ice again tomorrow. The floor is yours, uh, Jos. Okay, thank you, uh, Evert. I will uh, share my screen. So there. My uh, purpose for today is to, uh, to guide you through uh, some uh, performance determining uh, factors in, in, in speed skating. And what I would like to do is uh, to give you a, a little bit different look at speed skating when uh, the upcoming days uh, you are uh, just before the television screen and, and watching uh, our uh, uh, our skaters. Um, there are, uh, if, if you listen to the commentators on the television, then you, you, you hear stories and sometimes these stories, they are uh, spot on and sometimes they, they, they are a little bit nonsense. And what I hope after this, uh, uh, this presentation, you can uh, uh, help interpret uh, the, the 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 stories of these uh, these uh, commentators. Um, what I would like to do is uh, explain you first uh, uh, speed skating performance based on a, on a model. If we have a, a skater skating like uh, now's yesterday, a photograph from from yesterday is is a golden race. During his race. He is hampered. He, is, uh, uh, he had to overwin the air and the ice frictional forces, and these forces take energy. And the energy that's taken from the, the athlete had to be produced by his uh, muscular power system. So his body is working against the air friction and against the ice friction. Now, these frictional forces uh, act on the body. But when the body is moving, these forces, they, they, they cause a certain loss of power. So if we just explain what's going on on the athlete, we best can explain it based on power losses and power production. So on one side, you have the power production of the athlete. And on the other side, you have the power losses uh, from the environment. And this will result in velocity. So the velocity is the outcome of the power produced by the athlete and the power lost by the environment. Well, this can be put into a model. So if we have the model, on one side we have the power production and on the other side we have the power losses. And on the power production side we have uh, the aerobic power system, the anaerobic power system and the efficiency of these systems. While on the other side we have uh, the air friction and the ice friction and and if we have a model like this we can express this into uh, yeah let's call it a mathematical language so we can uh, just calculate based on what we know about the power production and power losses how the performance of the skater will be uh, if you look first at the uh, in detail to the power production of the athlete the aerobic power the aerobic power when the skater is skating, can, can relatively simply be measured. Well, I say simply be measured. Uh, uh, instruments like this, they, uh, they are costly. And these experiments, they, uh, yeah, you cannot raise an Olymp Olympic race while you measure it. So uh, you had to uh, organize specific uh, uh, experiments on the eyes to do that. But if we do that, we have an, an idea about how the aerobic energy will develop in time. Uh, at the beginning of the race, the amount of energy you produce by the aerobic system is relatively low and it, it goes to a certain maximum. The other 
part of energy is the anaerobic system. And the anaerobic system on the ice is very difficult to measure, but we can measure that just in a laboratory, for instance, on, uh, on the wind gate testing. And if you look at the wind gate testing, you have a high power output at the beginning, but that power output will go down really fast. And at the end of, 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 a, of a race, usually uh, the amount of anaerobic power used is uh, of a produced is relatively low. So these two systems together, they provide the energy for the athlete to work against the air friction and the ice friction. So the, the, the area under these curves are the total work done by the aerobic and anaerobic system. But these systems, they provide a certain amount of energy, but a certain part of that energy is only used to make speed. And that is defined by the efficiency, the efficiency of the athlete. And of course, uh, something like 20, 25 years ago, we had the, the development of this, the clap skate and the clap skate particularly did something with the efficiency of, uh, of the athlete. It increased the efficiency of a skater so that he could skate something like 5% faster. So if we look at the power production then, and, and we want to say uh, things about it, then we can, for instance, uh, look at the training of the athlete, the nutrition part, the skating technique, because skating technique is doing something with how much aerobic power you can produce with your legs or anaerobic power you produce. Warming up is a factor. Race strategy is a very important one. And the race strategy I will uh, uh, come back to uh, later in this talk to uh, explain the performance of uh, knives uh, yesterday. So back to the model, if you go to the, uh, the power losses, the power loss by air friction and ice friction, they depend on uh, skating technique, because uh, if you look at uh, uh, Wust uh, over here, and you have seen uh, her skate uh, two days ago probably, she kept her arms on their back. And that's, for instance, very good for the air resistance because the air resistance when your arms on, are on the back is, is lower uh, than when you swing your arms. So your skating technique is doing something with air frictional losses. And the same holds for your posture. Uh, when your trunk is more upward, your frontal area is larger. And when the frontal area is larger, the, the total force will be higher. So Skating technique is a very important uh, parameter. The smaller you are for the wind, so the smaller your frontal area, the lower your air uh, resistance will be. Uh, skating suits are a very important uh, factor. And uh, I would talk an, uh, an hour about this, but I have only 20 minutes to, to guide you through. So, but skating suits are very important. And, and, and you can see that the different countries have different suits, not only different in color, but also how they, are, uh, how they are made. But basically what you see is that some parts of the suits are very smooth and other parts are a little bit rough. And it's all done just to, buy, to, uh, to decrease the CD value, that's the aerodynamic drag value uh, of these suits. In uh, short track speed skating and at the mass start and the team pursuit, uh, skaters are using helmets. They can uh, uh, determine a certain amount of air friction as well. And an important thing is, of course, the ice. And uh, the ice and the interaction with the skating blades is uh, uh, important for the amount of ice friction. And on the ice friction, I will uh, uh, tell you a little bit more. Because uh, if you look at the uh, uh, at the races and after every couple of, uh, of, of, of races, they will flood the ice, they will clean the ice. And maybe you have heard the, uh, the, uh, the commentators, they say, well, if they clean the ice, they put warm water on the ice and, and the ice temperature will vary. And they did some measurements uh, at the Olympics and they, they said, well, the, the ice temperature before the flooding is minus eight and the ice friction of a minus eight and a half. Uh, and after the ice flood, flooding, it's minus eight. And, and that will have an influence on, uh, on the performance. Well, 
we are lucky that we have done uh, some measurements on that. We have a special skate with strain gauges in it, measuring elements that can measure the, uh, the push-off force and the, uh, the ice frictional force. And, and on the right, you see here a, a plot of, 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 of data uh, we gathered uh, already years ago, but it's the only data available where they measured uh, the ice frictional coefficient towards the, uh, the ice temperature. And, and here you see the optimal temperature is even a little bit lower than minus 80. So uh, if we look at this figure, if your temperature is minus 8 or minus 8.5, it will do nothing with the uh, ice frictional coefficient. So if I was the skater, I would prefer to have uh, my, uh, my pairing, my race right after the, the flood, because uh, I think then you're even in, in, a, in, in a better position than when the ice is even colder. So that's, uh, uh, let's call it a mid buster number one. Let's go to the second part. That's the pacing strategy. And in pacing strategy, what I would like to do is to look at the effect of the anaerobic power pro produced by the athlete on uh, the performance. Uh, we have an, an, a history of, of, of uh, uh, studies to, uh, to pacing strategy and, and, and luckily we have done some pacing strategies on, on skating as well. The important thing is that every part of this model can be uh, 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 represented by mathematical formulas. And if you put them all together, you can do simulations. And with these simulation studies, we can say something about optimal pacing. And that's what I would like to do now. So if we have the model and we know the power production and we know the power losses, like, uh, like the model is here, we can calculate velocity. But on the other end, if we have the model in place and we know the power losses and we know velocity, we can just calculate power production. So in an indirect way, we can say something about the power production of the athletes. And of course, the power production is partly aerobic and partly anaerobic. So if we assume that the, aer the aerobic system is uh, uh, behaving like uh, it is doing uh, in the laboratory or when we measure it on ice, we can just say something about the anaerobic power production if we use the model while measuring power losses and measuring velocity. And we were lucky in the uh, 2002 Olympics that we had the possibility to do so. We had uh, in Salt Lake City, in the ice rink, we had eight cameras, video cameras in the ceiling of the of the ice rink and, um, oh, sorry. We had uh, eight cameras on the ceiling of the, uh, the ice rink and with these cameras, we were able to measure instantaneously the velocity of the athlete on the rink. So we knew exactly the velocity. We had cameras on the side that we were able to measure the uh, trunk angle and the knee angles of the athletes so we can calculate the aerodynamic forces on the athlete based on models. And we did the on the ice measurements uh, of the ice frictional forces. And we did it just before the race and right after the race. So we, we knew exactly the amount of energy lost to ice friction. So if we have that, we can uh, just take our models for the aerobic and the anaerobic energy production well, uh, and mathematically they are uh, written like this, but uh, believe me that you have a certain maximal power output for the aerobic system and a certain uh, power output you, you, you end your race with. And for the aerobic system, you have a certain maximal aerobic capacity. And of course you have a certain time course that it takes before you're at your maximum. And you have a certain time rate, we call it, uh, that uh, uh, the, the power output is going down. So with this model, we can ca calculate these variables. And we do that this, the following way. Here, for instance, the blue line is the measured velocity. 
And with the model, we can just optimize the model based on what we know about the athlete. And in this case, it was the golden race of the uh, Derek Para. He was the golden uh, medal winner in Salt Lake. We just fitted the model. We optimized the model that the model was exactly scaling. That's the red line, like the race of Derek Para. So now we know if we know how the velocity is skated by the model, we can calculate the aerobic and the anaerobic contribution of it. Now we, we did it for not only the golden race, but also silver, bronze. We did it for, for all the races uh, at the Olympics. And here I've only depicted the, the first five. And here you see already that there is a certain difference in the velocity profile of these athletes. And we know that uh, we have seen it uh, yesterday as well with uh, the, the races of Neus and the other guys that uh, uh, the, the split times are a little bit different between them. Well, if we have all the models of these athletes, we know exactly how the anaerobic energy production of these athletes happened during the race. And also here we see differences between different athletes. And uh, if you put these five together, we see here all these anaerobic power output profiles. And we see one thing that is not a, just a winning strategy. Well, this one is a little bit different than the other ones, but he became fourth. That's uh, Joey Chick. He's more a sprinter type of athletes. And, and the other athletes were more or less uh, at that time, uh, more or less uh, uh, all-round type of athletes, because here we had Derek Para, silver was Jochem Uithagen, bronze was uh, the Norwegian um, uh, Sundral. Here we had uh, the fourth uh, Joey Cheek and the fifth was uh, its, it's, its postman. So if we have these anaerobic power production profiles during the race, you can say, well, maybe they were not skating optimal. So what we did, we took the model and we took the amount of energy produced during the 1500 meter. And we took as a kind of constraint that the amount of energy under the curve here should have been the same. And we looked if we could get a better velocity or a better performance of these athletes, if we distributed a little bit different. <laughs> so what we did, we did an optimization. So that means that you have thousands and thousands of ways how to skate a 1500 meter for each athlete. And of course, there is a certain optimum. And that optimum can be seen here. On the vertical axis, you see uh, the time. And here you have the two components for the anaerobic system. And, and the lowest part on this surface is the best time skated. And if we make just a plot from above on this surface, we see something like this. So these are uh, what we call uh, ISO lines. This was the position of the athlete on this ISO line landscape uh, for his variables for his anaerobic energy. And here, the golden medal was not even scaling on the most optimal place because the optimal place is somewhere over here. Now, what does he have to do? He has to have a, a little bit, he had to go a little bit to this direction this direction to be optimal. So that means that he had to uh, have a higher anaerobic uh, time constant so that it is falling down a little bit faster with a higher peak. And he had to have a lower amount of energy, anaerobic energy at the end. So this should have been the optimal race for Derek Parra. Well, we can do that for all these athletes and they have all a little bit different shapes of these uh, surfaces. If you look at the top again, then we see that they all are all away from their optimum, but Joey Cheek was closest to his optimum. And maybe you remember that he was the one with a high peak power up at the beginning and low at the end. Well, if we, so the, 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 the optimal race, is uh, having high velocities in the beginning and relatively low velocity at the end. Well, if we now take the, uh, the Olympics of, of yesterday and we look at the, uh, the lap times, 
we see that the uh, number one, two, and three at the fastest lap time, uh, the, let's say the, the, the first full lap. And here I calculated the relative speed because of, of course the first one is, a, is a faster anyway, but if you take the relative speed of these athletes, then you can compare these athletes uh, a little bit better. If you plotted the first six, so we have three medal winners and we have three non-medal winners. We see that the medal winners have the relative highest velocity at the first full lap, and they have the lowest velocity at the final lap. So that's exactly what we see here in an optimal race based on the, uh, on the model, a uh, high velocity in the first lap and the lowest velocity at, uh, at uh, the last lap. Now, why is this uh, advantageous? Well, of course, the average speed had to be as high as possible, but when you finish with a very high speed, you take a certain amount of energy with you, uh, the kinetic energy, uh, and you start with the kinetic energy of zero, of course, so you have nothing done with this energy. So uh, uh, a fast finishing speed is just a waste of energy. So what you need to do is you have, have to have a high peak at the beginning and a low velocity at the end. But of course, the velocity cannot be uh, very low because there had to be an optimum between the peak velocity here and the lower velocity there because the, the peak velocity at the beginning will cost you a little bit extra energy. So this is what we see here. So we see uh, the optimal race. And these athletes yesterday, they, they were just uh, uh, more or less behaving like what the model is telling to be uh, uh, optimal. So I would say, uh, good done, uh, Kjell Nijs. And uh, thank you for uh, your, uh, your, present, for, uh, your, uh, your presence at, uh, at this uh, uh, symposium. Thank you, Jos. <laughs> that was uh, a quite an uh, insightful uh, talk. And um, I will look at different eyes tomorrow when uh, they get on the eyes again. I, I have one question here about the pacing strategy in the chat from uh, Matthias, um, who we heard before. Um, he says already, maybe it's a strange question, but he always asks himself, would it not be a good strategy just to perform the 1500 meters as a 1400 meters and use the energy at that time to just glide to the last 100 meters? Well, um, if, if the energy tank is completely empty at 1400 meters, it's okay. But uh, as long as you can produce energy, you have to, to try to do that. And, and your anaerobic energy tank could be empty, but still your aerobic energy is, is uh, at full level. So, uh, what you need to do is to use your, your aerobic system for, uh, for the last part as, as maximal as possible. So when you stop skating uh, with, uh, at 1400 meters and just glide the last 100 meters, you, will, uh, uh, you, you, you forget for uh, eight seconds uh, using your aerobic system. And that's of course a waste. Thank you. Here's another interesting question from Jason Steeman in the chat. Um, these tests you just presented, they've been done at Salt Lake City, you know, the fastest track in the world, uh, lowest resistance. Would the optimal velocities be different at slower tracks, potentially at sea level? Yeah, there is, there is a clear difference between uh, uh, high altitude tracks and low altitude tracks. If you look at the, the, the optimal between uh, the, the peak velocity and the velocity at the end, uh, at low uh, uh, altitude tracks, uh, the air friction is a little bit higher. So um, what you see is that when you are low in energy at the end of the race, it will hamper you more. So. Um, at a high altitude, it's even more sprinting type than it is at, at the low altitude. But as we've seen yesterday, they, they skated uh, three seconds slower than the world record. And that difference is not that 
that large, but uh, there is a there is a difference. There is a difference. Yeah. Thank you. Now we're getting we're getting in depth, uh, Jos. Uh, an, another question here from the Um You you mentioned that it's best to start right after the ice preparation because of the low ice friction. But do you have any data about wind velocity during the diff, uh, during these different pairs? Because right after ice preparation, there are no skaters doing their doing their cooling down or they're warming up. Yeah, the, the, the more skaters that are on the ice, the, the better it is because you get a certain circulation. And uh, actually, uh, uh, at the Olympics of 2010, uh, we had a strategy with the Dutch skaters because at that time there were no regulations yet. So we, we had a, a kind of uh, uh, strategy that we told all the skaters, when there's a Dutch skater on the rink, skate as much as possible legs, a laps, even when your race is already done. Because at that time there was no, uh, no regulation. So when you had skated, you was allowed to stay on the ice and to, to skate your laps. So uh, the, the first couple of skaters, they, they, they were not important for medals any, anyway, but they were just cruising around as soon as the Dutch skaters were skating and they were sitting on the bench when somebody else was skating. And uh, the ISU, they, uh, they, they, they saw that and they made new rules. So you are only allowed one pair before uh, on the ice. And after your race, you are not allowed to do your cooling down on the ice anymore. So, uh, but it, it's, it makes a difference. And another thing is the, the, uh, the, 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 the circulation in the rink itself. Uh, in in TL, for instance, they have uh, the air vents they are in the direction of the skating velocity, the, the, the skating uh, direction. And there is a little bit wind over there. And one of the reasons why they skate always fast in, in Tialf is because of uh, this, let's call it uh, unfair uh, circumstances. Uh, there's another question now from Dionne. Uh, what is in your opinion, you know, the difference in suits between Sven Kramer, who only has the upper leg in rubber, and Kjeld and Patrick? Yeah, the, the, at the moment, uh, what I've done with the suits, I don't know. I, I was not involved in the, uh, the suits project this year. Uh, for 2018 and 2014, I was. And at, at that time, I know we, and know we had two different kinds of suits. We had the suits for, uh, let's call it the relatively lower velocities and higher velocities. And, and basically, the, the arms were different. Uh, in all our measurements, we, we found that uh, the arms made of uh, meshed material, so not the, the, the very uh, slick, smooth material, were performing better than the, um, uh, than the, 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 the smooth one were performing better at a longer distance, a lower distance than the, the, the the meshed one, the rough one, were for the, the higher velocities. And what I see with these athletes, uh, and I have a close look at them, they, they use different suits, but not at the distances I would have expected it. So I don't know what's going on. If they just do it by feel, or if they use the different suits based on a, a, a sound theory. Okay. A lot of question marks still. So. Um... Yeah, there's still a lot to, uh, to, 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 to look at and to, to discover. To discover. Hey, thank you, Jos, for this, uh, like I already said, really insightful talk. And uh, I think many will look uh, differently at, at you know, all the skaters um, for the rest of these Olympics. Thank you. It was a pleasure.